We're live. Aloha Kako. Thanks for joining us for our third interview of the evening. The organization putting on this live stream is Huli Pack. We were birthed from a shared drive to work our system and seek Aina based equity focused candidates um, to represent our Hawaii Island community. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are willing to circle back to our roots and instill real change within our communities from Kona to Kau, from Hilo to Havi. Conducting our interviews tonight are Claire Mason and myself, and we have the pleasure of interviewing Maurice Golding, who is running for County Council District 2. Maurice, why don't you take a couple of minutes to introduce yourself? Mahalo, Alexia and Claire for uh, this opportunity, and aloha, Kako. Um, my name is Maurice Golding. My website, my campaign website, is votingformaurice.com. You can spell F-O-R or put the number four, or you can truncate it to just voteformaurice.com. Either way, uh, you can find me there. Um, by nature, I am a hardworking problem solver who is uh, committed to community service. Uh, I served in Rotary for five years um, and our motto in Rotary is service above self. And that's something that I exemplify in my life. Um, last year, I was able to get our um, Rotary Club of South Hilo to commit uh, its next 10 years to focus on sustainability. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, I have a degree in industrial technology from Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, I have been um, the director of operations uh, for demographics group, vice president of operations for a large logistic group that transloaded over 100 uh, trucks a day and 12 rail cars a day. Uh, and also been a plant manager for a bottling plant. Currently, um, I fix machines uh, and um, do food uh, in the food and beverage industry. And I also consult in the food and beverage industry. Uh, I come from a very large extended family. Uh, my mother, um, who passed away 20 years ago, sadly, was uh, served as um, a clerk for uh, Seventh Circuit uh, Court of Appeals um, for almost 10 years. Um, I am a brother, I am a father, and I'm a fiance. Um, I have a passion uh, and devotion to, um, for the environment to save what we can, what's left of our family, of our planet and uh, our species. Um, I am uh, just very eager to put my skill set to, to good use uh, serving as uh, the Hawaii County Council District 2 member. Thanks so much for saying that, Maurice. Um, the first question for you this evening is what has inspired you to run for office at this time? Well, um, I believe I'm, I'm in a great place to, to serve the community right now. After having lived here for six years, I feel like I have a very good understanding of what the community needs are, especially after having served uh, in Rotary for five years and as club president. Um, you know, I wish I can say that um, I'm happy with uh, the state of affairs, but like most people, um, I'm not. And um, I think that the best thing that I can do is, is step up and do my part to help. Um, I don't think that um, any particular individual is to blame. I think everybody who is currently serving um, our government is doing the best that they know how. Um, but I believe that I can bring um, a certain education and understanding um, that will greatly help facilitate our common goals. Um, thank you, Maurice. Next question, um, also just kind of on a more broader sense, um, who in <clears throat> life currently do you admire? Who in my life currently do I admire? In public life. Oh, in public life. <laughs> Whew, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would have to say um, I have honestly, a very large admiration for uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, and I know that's um, not an answer that many Republicans would like to hear, but um, there are, are many reasons um, to, that I, I um, really admire her. Her perseverance, uh, the fact that she is extraordinarily intelligent, but you know, 
everyone says she was a, a bartender or waitress, you know, but she was brilliant. And um, she was um, inspired to, to run through the Bernie Sanders campaign, which um, I think is, is wonderful because uh, a lot of the messages that he had were things that I agree with. Although, um, you know, I don't agree with everything that either one of them does. Um, I, I definitely am a little bit more of a centrist, but um, yeah, <laughs> I may have just hung myself with that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for, for sharing. Um, yeah, then looking at your district a little bit more in focus, what do you see as the three most pressing issues facing the County Council District 2 at this time? Ooh, um, so specifically District 2, because <clears throat> they're, um, you know, right now, I think the, the biggest issue that the island is facing, which is, you know, also District 2, is food security um, and food sovereignty. If we're not growing our own food in the coming years, um, we're, we're doomed. And I'm sorry to be you know, the, the, <laughs> the so doomy, but <clears throat> um, if it wasn't for Chad Buck or the Hawaiian Food Alliance, uh, we would have gone without food during the pandemic. And the pandemic is very small compared to what's coming. If you pay attention to what's going on in California right now, uh, in not just California, but you know, now New Mexico and Texas, you know, because of global warming, uh, we have unprecedented burns. And um, because of unprecedented drought, I think it's a 1200 year drought in California, um, they're not gonna be producing the same amount of food that they used to. And then we also have an issue with soil health on the mainland that we have to look at. And the soil health has been largely damaged because of um, our agricultural practices, which um, we have started to adopt or have vastly ad adopt here on our large um, um, farms. So um, we need to get away from that and we need to be able to produce our own food. Uh, it is crucial that we do that. Um, also, um, you know, what's <laughs> at the forefront of my mind too is, uh, you know, gender inequity. Uh, we have a pay gap here in Hawaii, which doesn't make any sense to me, but there's a pay gap, not just, you know, in a whole, but also in the sciences, which doesn't make any sense to me. But, um, you know, that is, uh, that is a local problem as well as an island-wide and a state problem. Um, and the reason why it's a problem is if, if you don't feel that female issues affect you as a man, then look at it from a purely statistic point of view. If half of the population is, um, is being oppressed, uh, then they are not going to be in a position to help solve the problems. So we're cutting off half our capability to solving the future problems that we have and helping out. And that's, that's absurd. We shouldn't be doing that. So we have to find a way to, to get past that. Um, I would also say uh, housing is extraordinarily important to not just my district, but the entire island. People are being priced out of their homes, uh, whether they're renting or uh, trying to purchase homes. Um, and you know, when you see housing go up astronomically, <clears throat> you'll see houselessness go up. So um, those two things go hand in hand. If you look at statistics across the nation, uh, that um, locations with the highest housing prices will also have the, the highest homeless population. And I say homeless, just to make sure people understand, uh, I'm talking about the houseless people without houses. Thank you for articulating that. Issue that we know that you are passionate about from our research is Huhonua. Um, can you explain your experience with advocating um, around that issue? Absolutely. Um, and thank you for that question. So um, I've worked um, as a Mason um, for, gosh, close to 20 years in total. Um, and I've, I've worked on industrial smokestacks uh, for about 10 of those years. So I've worked at uh, nuclear power plants, coal power plants, oil and gas power plants. So I'm very familiar with power production. Uh, I've also worked for a company that um, did cryoblasting for 
the, uh, the generators. So we, we clean their generators. So I'm very familiar with power plants and um, how they are run and also how they evade EPA rules and regulations. Uh, while working in US Steel, I found um, that they would pay $17 million a year because it was cheaper to do that than to actually comply with the EPA. Now, focusing on Hawaii, when we look at power production, all the oil uh, and or fossil fuel uh, generated uh, power plants um, from a brief a uh, little bit of research into the EPA website, you could find that every one of them has been in non-compliance, at least um, you know, in some point over the last four years. One of them was majorly in non-compliance and um, that, they only found that out when they went and did an on-site inspection, which is very expensive for the EPA to come here and do that. They don't have anybody to, to look out and, and verify the information that's coming from the power plants. So when Hujo Nua said that they were going to be no dirtier than a fossil fuel power plant, that was unacceptable. When I found that out immediately, um, our air quality also, um, what they're doing with the eucalyptus. Now, I know this is up for you know debate with some people about what you can do with that wood, but I've seen that wood put to use. I've currently installed, uh, I have a house in Mountain View um, that I'm, I'm fixing up to, to sell and I'm putting in, uh, hardwood flooring that's eucalyptus hardwood floor that was grown and milled here in Hawaii. Anybody who uh, believes that that wood cannot be used for construction or cannot be used for products that we can make here on Hawaii, I ask you, don't believe me, go, go see Hal Bronner at Bronner Molding Woodworks. He's been here since the 80s. He has a, a sawmill out there that he's uh, been operating since then. And uh, he will set you straight. Um, so just burning all that wood, all that hard wood, instead of making houses with it, doesn't make any sense. So um, I had to speak out against Hu Ho Nua. Um, I know that there are many people who are counting on jobs that Hu Ho Nua would provide. And um, to them, I say, I'm sorry that you were snowballed by your company. Uh, that company believes in, in profit over people and over what's right for our environment locally. I think. Absolutely, Huhonua is an amazing project that we should have on standby. I think absolutely with what's coming in our future, what we, and we don't even know <laughs> what could possibly be coming in our future, we should have emergency power backup that can be used by, by potentially burning um, the eucalyptus if we needed to, but that would be, you know, um, an ex extreme exception. And I don't think we should have put the money into that kind of uh, emergency backup at this time. And it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's more expensive and uh, just uh, than alternative fuels that we, we have readily at our disposal. Um, have I gone over time yet? You're about there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to say that, you know, there's a lot that we can do uh, regarding um, hydrogen. Um, we have the infrastructure right now for, um, for natural gas in some areas, uh, specifically in my district. <clears throat> All those natural gas pipes could carry hydrogen. We could use um, solar power and wind power to produce, <clears throat> produce hydrogen, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, and that hydrogen to get us through, um, you know, peak hours uh, as, as needed. It could be an excellent backup and also it could be used uh, for fuel cells or, uh, you know, powering our, our vehicles at, at some point if we decided to go that way as a nation. Thank you for sharing that and new information on our end too. Interesting to hear. Um, I'd love to go back to the first issue that you pointed out for your district on food security and agriculture. I'm wondering what mechanisms um, you think the county council could kind of bring to the table to build soils in Hawaii or promote, um, you know, increased agricultural yields from agricultural land. Yes. Um, so I think I think a lot of people in Hilo, including um, a few of, of my opponents, think that um, this is not a a district two issue. 
And I would like to reiterate that it absolutely is a District 2 issue. Um, <laughs> when you think about where our food comes from, uh, if we don't get foods coming into our grocery store, we don't eat. Now, as you get to the farming districts, there's a lot of people who are producing food out there. They have access to food. They have backups. They know what to do when times are rough and shipments don't come in. In the city, we don't have that. So it's imperative that we do what we can con to contribute to, to helping this, this solution, move the solution forward. Now, <clears throat> one of the things we can do is we can um, create tax incentives. So we can create tax incentives for landowners um, to give very low cost lease to those who will grow staples here on our island. We can also give um, tax breaks to, um, <clears throat> to the farmers who are selling the produce. Um, we can create public education sur surrounding it uh, and creating um, more venues for those farmers to sell their produce. Uh, also, we could um, ask for um, local wholesalers like, um, you know, uh, Safeway and KTA. I mean, KTA already has some, some island brands <clears throat> or their island brands, their Apple, uh, Apple Mountain brand. But uh, to ask them to increase that um, as we start producing here, uh, have them make a commitment and start phasing in over the years so that we can get to a point where we're growing 85% of our food instead of importing 85% of our food. Um, we could also um, <clears throat> we could also create community gardens here in the park. We have a lot of space there in our park. Um, you know, recently there were some individuals who were um, given citations for trying to grow uh, plant a garden, which is something I know they they do. I think almost every year, but <clears throat> they're trying to make a statement, and uh, that statement is partially that that land should be growing food. And right now I, I've seen uh, the county come through and cut down all the coconuts prematurely. So they, they weren't ripe. Now, when I first moved here six years ago, they cut them down when they're ripe and people showed up with their trucks and filled up with coconuts. They were gone instantly. They were eaten, they were consumed. And now we're preventing them from growing the, the fruit that we need, you know? I mean, I know they're not a fruit, but <laughs> you know, um, the produce. And um, that's, it's more than shameful, it's, it's disheartening. And we can, we can prevent that, we can create a paradigm shift. Thank you, those are some great ideas. Thank you. Um, just to pivot a little bit, um, our foster care system <coughs> is really overworked and underserved. Um, as a county council member, do you have any ideas or solutions to assist with uplifting our foster youth and also the youth after they are finished going through the system so that they don't end up um, being in marginalized groups that are continuously underserved? Um, well, let me first just say, as, <laughs> as a former child of foster care, um, this issue is very important to me. Um, <laughs> I, you'll hear me say that a bunch about many issues, but it is true. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, and I, and I can't tell you for sure, but I wonder um, how much public education would help. Because I feel that the, the general public doesn't understand what a problem this is. I also feel that the general public doesn't understand how many kids need homes. I mean, I know um, people who are trying to get pregnant. And I wonder if they were made more aware of the need for children to be adopted or for you know, um, you know, foster homes to be opened up to the foster children, if if they would step up and and do that. <clears throat> the other issue is funding, and um, I think that there's a lot we can do to increase our budget um, as far as bringing in money. Um, I think there are grants that we could help go after. I think, um, you know, philanthropists, we could be knocking on their doors. I think for every, uh, you know, wealthy person who comes here and buys a 14 or $24 million mansion, we can ask them for, you know, 20% towards our, our foster care system. 
at least uh, you know, in the form of taxes <laughs> oh, or um, you know, I, I'm not sure beyond, beyond raising money and, and public awareness. I think those are, those are the key and that's, that's where it starts. Thank you, Maurice. Um, yeah, we're gonna change gears again here. The lease on military bases on our island will expire soon. How do you propose our local government should proceed at this time? Um, <clears throat> I don't think that the, um, the military facility on our island serves our community in any meaningful way anymore. Once upon a time, perhaps, but there are other places that they can train. Um, we already have weapons uh, that we are using um, and implementing now in, in Ukraine. We're in a war essentially with um, Russia. And um, <sighs> It's just, it seems unnecessary. And I think we should absolutely move uh, towards moving that military base and installation off our island. Thank you. On a similar note, um, what does Hawaiian sovereignty mean to you? And what does that look like from a legislative perspective? Um, From a legislative perspective, it seems like a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, uh, you know, we we have to accept that you know the United States illegally occupied Hawaii and and made it a state with, against Hawaii's will. It was a sovereign nation that governed itself, and. Uh, there is no way going back. There's no clear way of going back. Um, we are integrated um, and maybe not successfully and maybe not fully, but we have integrated enough that uh, the system that we have in place is the way forward. And I would say that to any uh, native Hawaiian who feels that the, the system is not serving them uh, and I, would agree with that sentiment. I would strongly suggest that they they run for office. Um, Prince Kuhio Kalaniana Ole, um, when he went into uh, self exile with uh, Lilu Kalani, um, when he came back, he served as a congressman for ten terms, I think, um, and he was able to effect some very uh, good positive change, and I think. The system is there for people to step up and to, to get elected. And I think that the population um, here has grown to understand that um, Hawaiians can't be put aside, that this is their land and they must be considered. Um, from a legislative slate of standpoint, um, I'm open to, to ideas, but I, I can't begin to, to tell you what we could do um, to, to properly serve them other than to encourage them to, to run and take on government roles and make those decisions for themselves. Thank you very much. Um, and shift gears a little bit. Uh, we talked about the potential job creation of Huhonua, but wondering if there are other exciting opportunities apart from that one um, in your district relating to climate change mitigation um, that you're looking forward to potentially collaborating with if you were to take office. Related to climate change education? Mitigation, so mitigation. economic opportunities or jobs in climate change mitigation. Yes. Well, I mean, absolutely. As we um, as we shift away from fossil fuels, there are going to be more green energy jobs, uh, more wind and more solar. And um, as I said, um, you know, the creation of uh, hydrogen through um, um, I forgot what the process is called. I'm sorry, um, but taking water and using electricity to separate the hydrogen from the water. Um, 
and we're experimenting on the other side of the island right now with that. Um, I think, is it Nella? Nella? Yep, I, I'm sorry, okay. I can't remember. I'd have to look it up, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been a lot of breakthroughs in that technology in the last year, as well as a lot of uh, breakthrough in battery technology. So um, we have, um, we may have the means to actually manufacture um, batteries here, but we'll definitely have um, the need for um, as we uh, shift away from um, from fossil fuels and uh, and into electric vehicles, we will need to revamp our entire grid. So there will be more jobs there, and um, so I, I'm excited about that. Um, also, in line with that, though, is um, when we produce our own food here, um, that is in line with um, lowering our greenhouse gases uh, and focusing on, on you know, mitigating uh, global warming <clears throat> because we won't be um, you know, buying food from Mexico or, <laughs> or the, anywhere on the mainland, um, or we'll be buying a lot less food, I should say. So um, we could also, um, and we will also, um, you know, start um, you know, food manufacturing here. So we, you know, we absolutely need a cannery now, um, but I, I foresee several canneries and uh, those canneries will can food that will be used here, but also can be shipped um, to other locations. Right now, most of the boats that come into Hawaii um, leave empty. So, um, you know, shipping them back full with goods that were produced here is um, more efficient. ideas thank you what are some of the um the infrastructure needs specifically for your district wow um currently i would say um our roads and and traffic lights um roads are a serious issue uh it's my understanding that uh we're on track for like a 50-year replacement so every 50 years, every road will be replaced like slowly over that, that time period, um, which uh, means that we're not fixing our roads fast enough. So we have to look at, at um, alternative methods of fixing our roads because they're not lasting as long as they should. Um, and I certainly am not trying to take away anybody's job by creating roads that last forever, <laughs> but, and nor could we actually do that, but we, we do need to find um, a different way to, to go about it. We also need to expand some of our roads. Um, there are certain roads where we need to put in an additional lane at, um, at traffic stops. Uh, we could easily um, upgrade our, our traffic lights to be on a, a smart um, grid system where uh, it'll allow traffic to go in one direction for a certain period of time. They're not properly timed out right now. And I think, um, you know, this isn't a new idea. I think funds are, are just low for that right now. But um, I think there's money coming through the pipeline through the, um, the government from the federal government um, from Build Back Better. And hopefully some of that money can be allocated towards that. Um, but if not, um, you know, we certainly have the means to put it into our, in our budget in the future. Thanks. Um, also, I'm sorry, just also in line with the infrastructure, um, I did mention, um, you know, building community gardens, and I think that falls under that as well. I like that classification. <laughs> Good one. Um, moving gears to back to the economy, one question we have for you is how would you foster and nurture small businesses in your district? Hold on one second. Sorry, <clears throat> I have a neighbor with a uh, very noisy diesel truck. Um, could you say that question one more time? Yes, the question is, how would you foster and nurture small businesses in your district? How would I foster and nurture small businesses? So <clears throat> this is, 
one of the most difficult things for me, um, having talked to a few businesses that have gone out of business, um, you know, post pandemic or, you know, during the pandemic has been that um, their rent has been doubled. Um, so they were successful and then their landowner decided that they deserved uh, a cut of what they were making and it just wasn't feasible. So we lost businesses that way. Um, we have to find a way to prevent that. And that might be some version of rent control. Um, and I know landowners would hate to hear that, but um, right now we have you know, so many empty places because people would rather it sit empty. Landowners would rather their place sit empty than reduce rent. And um, a lot of these um, buildings are not being properly cared for. And um, we need to have a very um, long, thoughtful discussion with these landowners and find out what are the obstacles to them taking care of their building and see if we can find a way to help them. Um, so just having affordable, um, affordable rent would be go a long way in helping um, local small businesses. Um, beyond that, um, I think that we could find a way to showcase our businesses better. I think the um, Downtown Improvement Association uh, has done a lot um, for that. And I think that um, they are uh, an amazing force, um, you know, working to, to help local small businesses. And I would like to partner with them um, as a council member and uh, hear more about what they have to say, what they would like um, from a council member um, to, to that extent. Thank you. What are um, your preferred modes of communication with the community and how do you plan to continue transparent outreach with, with your community? Oh, wow. So <laughs> I will tell you, I, I'm not a big fan of social media. And um, the majority of that reason is because um, the social media we, we use is um, owned by Meta Facebook. And um, I have serious problems with one company having access to that much information, as well as the fact that uh, Mark Zuckerberg has removed people from uh, their land on Kauai. And maybe it was technically legal, but I feel it was highly unethical. Um, so um, I'm not a big fan of, of social media, but um, email or phone call. Uh, my phone is, is public, uh, the campaign number that's actually in my cell phone. So people are welcome to call me or they're welcome to email me. Um, as a uh, member of council, um, I will absolutely have one night a week where I will hold nighttime hours so that I can be fully accessible to people. And if that's successful, if people um, are reaching out to me and it's needed, you know, more nighttime hours are needed, then I'm absolutely open to shifting my schedule to add as many hours as needed. Um, <clears throat> also, as far as communicating with the, um, um, our people, this is one of the biggest issues right now in government here is that um, people feel a great distrust for um, government. Um, and it might not be necessarily that the bank government is just out for themselves, but they don't feel that the government is out for them. And largely, I think that's because there isn't enough communication. Right now, there are so many things that are happening in government that are going to improve our lives in the future. But I can tell you maybe one or two of them, you know? So, <laughs> because we don't know what's going on and they can say, well, you can look at our, our website and you can look at um, you know, our Facebook, but <sighs> there isn't a single government official who posts anything anywhere enough to allow people to feel like they understand what's going on and how their government officials are working for them. And that's something I absolutely would change. Um, if you sign up for um, my newsletter, um, you will get at least a monthly digest and you will also get, um, I would like it to be a weekly digest. And then uh, once a month, I would like to host uh, a town hall style meeting where people could come out on a weekend and um, 
voice their opinions and and find out from me personally if they would like instead of just reading my newsletter as far as what's going on. Also, um, for big items that I think that are people would have a very strong opinion one way or another, even if I think they'll have opinion against what my opinion is, I will make sure that everyone knows ahead of time that action is needed, that the council needs to hear from, from people concerning those issues. So they're not learning a week later in the news that something happened and that there was um, uh, time for testimony that they, they missed. Thank you. Thank you for articulating that, super interesting. Um, one of the most important decisions or votes that the county council members can make right now is on land use and development, especially considering um, the rapid changes that are occurring to our population here. So I have two yes or no questions for you. And I understand that there's uh, definitely case by case consideration on land use. But the first one is telescopes, construction sites, and commercial activities in many areas of Hawaii Island have been carried out in areas zoned as conservation. Do you believe these special use permits are hindering our capacity to protect and preserve our land? That's very hard to answer, <laughs> you know, again, case by case. Um, I, I mixed on that. I, I would absolutely say yes and no, um, you know, um, I think, yeah, I, I can elaborate, but you're asking for a yes or no. <laughs> I, I can give you yes and no. Okay, let's, uh, we can open it up. Well, <clears throat> so there, um, there's a lot that we can do for conservation um, that let's say, like you mentioned the telescope, so the 30 meter telescope, I know that's a heated uh, topic. And personally, um, as a person who uh, has um, had a subscription to Scientific American Magazine since he was 13, um, I am not in any way an astronomer, but I know the importance of astronomy. And, and I know the importance of this telescope. And I would like for there to be, and there should have been uh, discussions long ago. There should have been uh, honor. Honor. Uh, there should have been uh, the government should have honored its its commitment and its word to the people about uh, disabling other in deconstructing other telescopes before it moved forward with this one. But it doesn't take away from the fact that this telescope is is in fact needed. Um, I think that. We, we should do more in, in that instance um, to, to make it right. Um, I think that it's incredible, incredibly uh, painful <clears throat> thinking about how Hawaiians um, were expert navigators and astronomers, and we live almost at the epicenter of astronomy in the world and it's not being taught in our schools. We have some of the best scientists in the world coming to our island and we're not taking advantage of that and having them teach classes to, to our students here beyond university, you know, um, is my understanding. Perhaps there's been a few classes here or there at, at the high school level, but this should be something that should be an ongoing program that helps, um, you know, with our education across the board. Um, beyond the telescope, I'm not aware of um, any other uh, project that's um, hindering potentially um, conservation, um, but I am extraordinarily for um, conservation for our environment, not just here locally, but globally, um, but obviously, especially locally. So. It's, it's a hard question to, um, to answer just yes or no, unfortunately. Thank you for elaborating. And then I'm gonna give you the second yes or no question too. Hopefully this one will be a little less nuanced. 
Um, do you support the rezoning of agricultural lands to residential? I absolutely do not. Great, thank you. Can I, can I say something more on that subject, please? Um, yeah, sure, because we only get one more question in. Too. Okay, so there's been um, land that's been um, zoned, that is zoned agriculture, and they're selling agricultural lots of one acre lots. And I know I forgot the name of the development where this is happening over on the Kona side, where it's obvious no one there is going to be growing um, anything. I think that um, the developer and or the people who are buying there, if they're buying in an agricultural zone, that they should face an annual fine unless they're growing ag there. They have to have some ag, some portion has to absolutely be used for ag. And if, if it's not, then that money should, they should be fined and that money should go towards food production here directly to offset the, the land that was lost. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it over to Claire for the last question. Um, another question somewhat surrounding transparency. What are your views on free and fair elections and do you support publicly funded elections? <laughs> yes, I, I support uh, public funded elections. Um, so years ago, I came up with the idea of free elections. And I know that um, that sounds like it's the same thing, but it, it um, and it kind of is. Now, it, it really, my concept kind of relies on um, a suspension of the First Amendment in some people's minds, at least. Um, if, if no one put up signs, if no one printed these signs and pamphlets and business cards that just get thrown away at the end of the year, or maybe held on for the next run, you know, but eventually thrown away. Uh, if no one did that, and instead we just had a sign that we put up you know, it's an election year, go to whatever website, and it'd be a public website. Listen, listen to NPR, and NPR could absolutely um, extend uh, and create another station that's exclusively for, for politics in election year, and where everyone gets the same amount of coverage. So you have equal coverage, and um, no one is buying advertisements, no one is, is paying for more signage, then we get the money out of politics. Um, so I'm not saying it's a perfect system. I'm not saying that we could absolutely make my concept work, but um, it's just an example of how much I, I believe uh, that we need free and fair elections. We have to get the money out of it. Um, you look right now at who the current donors are or how I should say, how much the donations are to um, um, my opponents, uh, at least at least one of them. The other one, I suspect, I, I hadn't seen their filing because I think they, they filed late. Um, you know, you're talking thousand dollar, two thousand dollar donations. You know, most of them are in that range. Um, I don't know people, um, you know, many people that can donate that kind of money, and that's the kind of money that buys an election. You only need, you know, maybe twenty thousand dollars for this seat, you know, to, to run an election campaign on it. So theoretically, somebody could have twenty friends who are well to do that each donate a thousand dollars, and and that will give them all the campaign money that they need for this. And that's if they've signed on to stay underneath the twenty one thousand um, dollar um, ceiling um, that you voluntarily can sign on to in this position. A lot of people don't know that, but um, I've, I've signed on to that. Um, I'm definitely not gonna spend more than that, um, but you, one could, and if, if they do elect to do so, then they do have to pay more um, to register to, to run as a candidate. Um, but theoretically, um, the sky's the limit. Um, so they, they will get elected because of name recognition. So right now, people like me are relying on people like you who are doing your due diligence and in interviewing candidates to help get our, our name out. And I'm relying on going door to door and talking with people face to face and letting them, them know who I am. Thank you, a lot of great points I'm, there. I'm happy with that. I think that's how everyone should do it. Definitely. 
Thanks so much. And that's our last question for the evening. Big mahalo, Maurice, for joining us this evening and sharing many different ideas across a wide variety of issues. Um, really grateful for you this evening and Claire as well for being with us for three interviews tonight. Thanks so much. Um, at Hulipak, we're building something that the political establishment we believe has never seen before, a slate of Pono candidates for Hawaii Island. Your donation can help directly um, contribute to candidates that are fulfilling this vision. And so we ask that if you get a chance to visit our website at hulihai.com to support Pono candidates for Hawaii Island. Mahalo for joining us this evening and look forward to future interviews. Thank you. Mahalo.